Welcome to the Dream Mason Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Terranova. A Dream Mason is a person who's brave enough to declare they have a dream and committed enough to do the work to build it. I know we all have a Dream Mason inside of us, and my dream for this podcast is to support us by giving us a glimpse inside the hearts and minds of leaders, creators, and innovators to help us unleash our inner Dream Mason. Because your dreams don't build themselves. What's up? And welcome back to the Dream Mason Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Terranova. And today's podcast is 15 years in the making. Every Dream Mason I get the pleasure of introducing to you guys is an honor. But when someone I know, a friend, is out there in life, creating and building their dreams, and I get the ability to bring them on this podcast and introduce them to you, to share their vision, their mission, their passion, and their journey, it's really special. Today's guest is Ryan Parrott. Ryan is one of those people. Ryan is a writer. He's written TV shows like Chance and Revolution. He just had his pilot, Second Self, optioned by Sony and Overbrook Entertainment. He's written award-winning short films that have been shown at Cannes, and he's also written the New York Times bestseller, Batman, Gates of Gotham comic book series for DC, as well as IDW's Star Trek comic book series, Boom's Go-Go Power Ranger comic book series, and in August, his owner-created comic book series, Volition, with Aftershock comics will be released. But Ryan is also a friend, and he has been relentlessly pursuing his dream of being a professional writer for over 15 years. Ryan and I talk about the journey, how it doesn't ever look how we expect, how it's often impractical, it doesn't make sense, and yet if you keep going, you keep pursuing, you can get there. We talk about how the road to your goals is often long, and it's a consistent choice of going and moving forward before you're actually ready to. We talk about how goals aren't about the how you're going to do it, but it's about moving forward and you figure out how along the way. We also talk about the stops and the things that get in our way in the pursuit of our goals and how we have to keep moving forward in spite of them. We talk about the hunger and the thing, that thing inside of you that pushes you forward towards your greatness and your goals. We also discuss myths that we craft as societies around artists and the gold that they produce. And there's something really cool that we get into, which is the idea of building a ladder of success by surrounding yourself with other hungry and motivated people that you work together, basically, to pursue your dreams and you pull each other up. Ryan's belief that we just keep going, keep pursuing, and never giving up will support us in making it is something that I just totally jive with and connect with. I know you guys are going to get a ton of value from this episode, and it's just such a pleasure to introduce you to Ryan. If you haven't already, please support me in this podcast by subscribing and leaving a review on iTunes, Google Play, or YouTube. Follow me on Instagram at inspirationalalex and share this podcast through Instagram with a friend by tagging them. If you're a high performer or you know one and you're looking for an edge, you have a desire to expand your leadership, generate more money, more time, and feel more fulfilled, reach out to me. And let's see how we can support you in making that life a reality. Now let's get into it. I'm excited to introduce you to Ryan Parrott. Hey, Ryan. What's up, man? It's good to have you on the Dream Mason podcast. That's a pleasure to be here, man. I'm very excited. <laughs> it's funny to, I'm laughing because it's, it's a funny thing to have you on here and say the name of the podcast and have you as a guest. It's cool and it's funny. And, you know, as I said in the intro, you know, we've known each other, I don't know, if, like, I want to say like almost 15 years probably now. 15 years? Jesus. <laughs> I mean, we met in our early 20s, so it's yeah. not a full 15, but we're coming up on that. And yeah. I think, you know, we both met at points in our life where we hadn't really been done much. You know, we had a lot more fun. We were trying different things and whatnot, but it's cool to, to say, hey, like now we're actually having a conversation about something I'm doing and things you've done and are continuing to do. Yeah, we, we've probably technically done this podcast like 27 times over <laughs> the 15 years already. Just in different, you know, now we're just actually recording it. But yeah, that's crazy. That's really the 15 years, man. That's an, 
it's pretty incredible. Uh, yeah. Wow. Sorry. So I was like, okay, now I'm back to being normal and not being able. It's also, I'll try not to nod because I can see you and I'm doing the nodding yes and no thing. It's a podcast. Don't do that. That's a, that's a bad way to start. Um, wow. That's crazy. Um, yeah. Like, well, yeah, go ahead. Let me, let me ask you. So, you know, like I, I told people about things you've done. I told them who you are to me, but who are you? Like, what do you want people to know about you before we jump into here that wouldn't be in a bio, wouldn't be on like your website page or that you wouldn't talk about like at Comic-Con or something? Um, what do I, gosh, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, what do I want people to know about me? I, I, don't, I guess, you know, like in some ways I, I would say like, it's, in, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, like six, like overnight success stories and stuff like that. And like, it, it really is such an incredible, like you really, if you're, if you're trying to get anywhere, uh, I think the thing that I, I like to think that I'm sort of a representative is represented representative of, <laughs> um, if I had to pick anything, I, I would say it's that as long as, and it's not so cliche, but as long as you actually enjoy doing what you're doing, um, the process is part is as successful as the actual is, is as enjoyable as a success. Um, like I, it's when you said like, so when you said like, we've known each other 15 years, I'm like, wow, that means I've been writing for 15 years. I'm like, well, how, what do I have to show for it? Like, I was literally like, I, was like, I need a bookcase or something to, to remind myself. But like, I just really, it just, it's funny how you can work in so many things over time. And then like, it's weird to like take a step back from it and go, wow, I have been doing this for a while. I guess I'm technically a professional, even though you never feel like you're a professional. So I don't know that maybe that would be what I want to think. It's like, if I'm, I'm a professional working writer, quote unquote but I do not feel at all like I am still a professional working writer, so. Well, it's a cool, I think about this, I have this thing and I, I think this applies to a lot of people that have big dreams or are willing to have big dreams. It's almost like the end zone keeps moving as you get closer and closer to it. So yeah. there was a time where you were, uh, knowing you, I can say this about you, you would have killed to just be a working writer. <laughs> now, you're a wor now you're a paid working writer, you don't have like a side gig and yet, there's still, there's another goal that you have. It's like the end zone. You, right as you were about to cross the line, it was like, oh no, here, I'm going to move back a little further because now there's another thing that I want. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I mean, if you, exactly. If, if when we had first met, uh, can I say where we first met? Do you remember this? I remember where I met you. Please. You're, you're probably the only person who has been on. Well, I've had some people that have been on here that have known me a long time, mm -hmm. but you're the first person that lived with me. That <laughs> we actually lived together as roommates yeah. for like quite a few years. So yeah, yeah, share, please. No, yeah. Well, I first met you, I, I remember we, I went to Islands where Sean worked and uh, he was, I think it was Islands, right? And I, I, I came up to the bar and he was like, oh, I have to do some side work, hang out here. This is my friend, Alex. And you just, and you were there. I think you might've been on your lunch break and we just sat there and talked to the bar for like an hour and then Sean was finally done. And like, and then the best part was he was like, yeah, Alex is possibly looking for a place to move in. And we're like, oh, cool. And then we ended up living together, I think within six months, <laughs> which I'm always like, wow, I remember, like, it's funny. Cause like, I still talk to you more than I talked to Sean. And it's just weird how like people step into your lives. And I had no idea that that was, that, that, that 15 years later we'd be talking about this. Like it's, it's just crazy how that, how that happens. But I, you know, regarding the end zone stuff, absolutely. I think if I had, if we had talked there and you'd have said, guess what? In 15 years, you're going to be writing this comic book and this comic book and you'll have done all these things. And I'd be like, you're out of your mind. Like I would never have believed you. But then as I was working this morning, I was like, there's moments where you're right. You're just like, oh God, do I really have to do this? So it's funny how the end zone changes, but also like, the things that you're like, I wish I could do that. It would be so much fun. And then there's times where you're literally, it becomes your job and you're like, I hate every minute of this. <laughs> so yeah, it's funny how it, it's funny how it, it shifts and how you change and what you want changes. And you know, it's all just a big journey. You just hit on something really cool. We, I noticed this happens for me. We really want things and then we get them and they become a problem. They're just, a, they're a new problem in our life. So I, not that long ago, I really wanted to help train these coaches and leaders on a project. Mm -hmm. And then I got an opportunity and it was in Chicago. And the first thing I went was, oh, now I got to go to Chicago every month and I got to do this. And all of a sudden, this thing that I wanted became the next problem. Yeah. And I had some great people around me were like, you just got exactly what you asked for. And now what our brain does with it is it's, you know, because it never shows up. Nothing ever shows up exactly the way. No, nope. it's just not life. 
Yeah, well, it's weird. It, it almost feels like you have these dreams about what you want to do and you're like thinking down the line, okay, when that moment happens, that will be amazing. But, but I think you also think that you'll be, you'll be different, that you'll be ready for it or you'll like, or that you'll have it, you'll have, when that moment comes, you'll know exactly what you have to do and it'll be easy. But the weird thing is you get that moment and you sort of look at yourself and you're like, oh, I thought I would know so much more or I thought this would be <laughs> so much easier. And it, then, so you get it and you're like, now you've actually got you that thing you were dreaming of you finally got and now you're like oh man if i screw this up like that that's that thing that that's that weight i think that that comes for me even to this day i never i always thought when i would get to certain points i'd be like oh this will be easy i'll know how to do this and yet i i'm i'm realizing even even every day and every project i work on i'm always like wow i'm i'm you, you're trying to find that thing inside that you're like i guess i'm ready for this i'm i does, does everybody feel like this does everybody feel this weight of expectation of it's it's like a, a, the two parts of it it's like i got it oh no now i gotta actually do the thing that i've been waiting for yeah and that's and that's intimidating <laughs> yeah that's great i love how you say it what's so here let's i want to go back i want to share your the journey because as we've talked about like i think your journey is is really powerful and i think that people forget like what it takes to get somewhere and how easily it would have been to quit and go find something else on anything big or audacious that anyone's trying to do. So, but to set that up, like, where are we going? What's the, what's the next big goal that you're trying to achieve in your life? Um, well, the, the fun thing is because you're, I'm having this conversation with you, like I can't spin the narrative and lie about things like I do with other people. Like you were actually there, <laughs> so you know, so I have to be way more honest in this podcast than I normally would be. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, I mean, right now I'm lucky enough, like I'm, I, I'm writing four comic books right now, uh, which is a lot for each month. Um, and they're awesome and really exciting. Uh, and I'm writing, I'm currently writing a movie that I've been working on that we sold. And, uh, I, I just got last year, I worked on a television series for the first time. So, so I've been very lucky, um, that I've actually gotten to sort of, you know, dabble in, in, in several different mediums, all of the mediums that I really, really wanted to work on. Um, so now I think the goal for me is to sort of I got, I got my foot in the door in a few spots. Like it, even though I've been working, I've been writing, you know, go, go power Rangers. I've been writing that for over a year. Like it still feels like I've only been doing that for a year. So, excuse me. Um, so the goal is, is to sort of, I think for me is to sort of take is uh, like as a creatively, the goal for me is to take everything that I've learned over the last year and actually be able to execute it. I've learned the rules. I've learned the rules of how to write, in television. I've learned the rules on how to write in comics and movies. Now I think the goal creatively is to take those rules and start to bend them and break them and actually find the things that I want to do. Find those things that when you were first in film school, you're like, okay, I want to be David Fincher or I want to be Christopher Nolan. And like, it's, we all go in with that mindset of like wanting to be one of the greats, but like, you don't know the rules yet. You don't know the business. You don't know all those elements. So it's once you learn all those and understand the politics of every, of every medium has different politics. So once you learn all those, it's like, okay, now I know it. How can I actually get back on the path to um, finding the things that excited me? It's actually like a back, it's a weird ping pong back and forth. I find that that happens in every medium. So creatively, that's what I want. And then, you know, professionally, I think it's just, you know, like, television it's such a crazy time in television I, I remember 15 years ago when we talked there was we had no idea I think that where where television would go and so for me it's it's getting back into that world a little bit it's being able to I've, I've got all these sort of opportunities that are in front of me right now it's the idea is, is like is now I have to actually activate on them I, I actually have to to take them and go so specifically you know it's just it's just getting back into the a television room and 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 uh, building off the the stuff that I've learned is there a is there a uh, a quantifiable marker that you could say you know like look I when I think about this podcast or I think about my 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 practice when I think about my book there's quantifiable markers there's numbers I want to hit and downloads are the amount of podcasts like right now for me I want to put out a hundred podcasts I believe that when I get to a hundred either in the journey of trying to get there or around that point something massive will occur with the podcast. That's made up in my mind, but I just think if I'm that committed, something yeah. will really shift. And 
same thing, like my book is getting a book published, right? There's a quantifiable thing. I want to be a published author and, and I want to say the self help personal development space. Mm -hmm. Um, for you, is there a quantifi a quantifiable goal that you would say that you want to hit that you would know, Hey, I actually did it. The end zone can't move on this thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, ego, ego wise, I would be like to create my own show. That would be, that would be something I never realized I really, really wanted to do. Um, because the cool thing of it's a it's a quantifiable goal because what's great about that is if you if you do it if you create a show and you sell it to a studio and a network and then it happens um you immediately sort of get thrown into the deep end um and you have to figure it out as you go along and the great news is that's that's where a lot of unfortunately when you're at the lower levels of a television room there's still a lot of parts that are sort of there's a lot of curtains that you still haven't seen behind because you're just not in those meetings or you're not in those um those conversations so when you create a show that yet sort of pulls all those curtains back and you get to be there and so you get to a lot of my preconceived notions or ideas of how i think things work i would get to finally see how they actually work so i think that would be i mean if i could ever find a way to to do that, that would be sort of the goal. I don't, it's a big goal, but it would be, a, it'd be a, even if it would just, and to be fair, like the same way you were saying, like you have like this idea of like, okay, if I get a hundred, if I do a hundred podcasts, that will, that will get me to a certain level. You don't even, and you probably don't even know right now what that would be. Yeah, no you know, idea. Put in that time that that will, it will make the product better. Um, the, the, the opportunities, even opportunities you haven't even imagined yet will come. That's exactly how I feel about if I was able to sell a show or create a show, because that would open up doors in areas that I might not even know. Like people, I've had meetings where people are like, what show do you want to work on? Or what's your ultimate goal? And, I, and I've literally said, I'm like, I don't know. I, I think the show that I want to work on is either being created right now or, or hasn't been created yet. And so it's hard for me to say, I know what I like, but I don't know where that path's going to go. It's not as much a path as is like, if I do this, this will teach me what I need to be able to make the next step. But creating a show is the goal. I mean, yeah. that's, the, yeah, it's a really exactly. long answer for a very simple <laughs> question. Yeah. I think, look, I, one of my, I, I don't know if I've, how many times I've used this on the podcast, but it's my favorite analogy about like about goals. And it's, it just goes all the way back. The wizard of Oz is perfect, right? It's like, I want to get to Emerald city. Cause that's where I think the thing that I need is. Yeah. Now the journey, somebody says, Hey, go this way right? Follow the yellow brick road. Mm -hmm. But it's not as it seems. There's twists and turns. Things aren't what they appear to be. There's obstacles and circumstances that show up. But ultimately, the person that gets to Emerald City stays on that path. If they quit that path, they can't ever actually get there. That's yeah. the one thing that no matter what shows up, they keep their commitment to get there. And then when they get there, what's so cool, right, is it's not even what it seems. It's not the, the answers aren't there. And now there's a new thing that they have to do. And I think we think that, right? I'm saying a hundred and who knows? And you're saying a show, you could get to a show and it could be everything but what you wanted. But if you don't actually know where you're going, you don't get to have that journey. And that actually brings us right back to your right. journey, yeah. which is cool because, you know, look, we met, I, I think when, when we met is a great place to start because we were, we were young, we were in our early twenties, you were writing. I mean, I want you to dive in. Tell us like what it was like at that starting point and, and really the challenges that you faced. Um, all right, let's be blatantly and brutally honest. Um, <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, so like, so I went to, I'll just give a little backstory. So I went to Chapman uh, University in Orange County. Um, and uh, I, was, I, I was a late transfer. I wanted to be an artist and I tried to transfer it in late. And so I kind of came in and uh, as a senior or junior and started doing short films really early. And I got lucky, like one, one or two went to Sundance and Cannes. And so like I came out and was really, I was like, wow, this is, this seems easy. This is, this is the way it's supposed to work. This is, I'm on the path. This seems like the good path. Um, and then right out of that, I got to direct a feature, um, which was this very low budget action movie that I would never recommend anybody ever watching. Um, <laughs> but I learned, uh, or one of our roommates, Sean, or was in it. I remember, I remember this movie. You do remember this movie. God bless you. Uh, I remember the title. You, let's not, let's not. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was rough, but like, once again, like it was a very hard process, but I learned how to make a movie. Um, and then after that, I sort of found myself trying to figure, like, that was the first time on the path where I was like, I don't know where the next turn is. I don't know where I go from 
from this. And I just started interning and doing, I started doing what I'd heard other people had done. And in the middle of that, um, I was interning for different, different directors and so on and so forth, thinking that was the next step and discovered that that wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and so I, I quit, I was going to quit and I was, and, uh, Sean, uh, was going to get me a job as a bar back. Um, and I was going to be like, all right, I'll go, I'll go back. Uh, and I'll, and I'll learn how to do this because that, you know, the, the restaurant industry, hopefully will keep churning along jobs and I can do that. And I can write during the day and do that at night. And literally as I walked out the door, um, one of the women who I had met, who was where it shared an office with the, the person I was quitting for came out and said, Oh, Hey, I heard you were leaving. And I was like, yeah. She's like, well, I don't know if you're interested, but our nanny is leaving. Uh, he's got another job and we need someone to take care of our two sons who are great baseball players and just need someone to drive them around. Um, and you can write during the day. And then from like three o'clock on, you can take care of them until we get home. Um, and I was like, well, that seems easier than I didn't know how to be a bar back. So I thought I would do that. And I thought, well, that, that will be, that can do that. That will be where I can write. Um, and I did that for three years and I was a nanny. Um, and in that time, it, it, it was, it, that's it. It was only actually, it, it was, was only three, three years. years. Yeah. Wow. Cause I, I mean, I remember, I mean, I obviously we lived together during a big portion of this. I remember that. And uh, wow. It seemed like those were a lot, those, uh, it felt like a lot longer, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, the cool thing was about that, that particular story was like, I, I had no intention of ever being an aunt. I didn't know what I was doing, but like I ended up getting to be sort of, and I wasn't really a nanny. These kids were pretty much for a lot older than like, I wasn't, you know, I think they were 10 and no, they were older than that. They were 12 and 14. I think when I was driving them around, I think, right. That sounds about right. Well, they couldn't, I, re I remember this as like, they couldn't drive. That was yeah, the key. literally was like that's they all. could function as they didn't need somebody to like, they, you weren't a babysitter. You, they no. needed somebody to get them from place to place. That's yeah, what I, I cooked badly, cooked awfully, almost <laughs> killed them so many times with salmonella, uh, and then drove them around. Honestly, if, if, if it happened today, Uber would have just replaced me. <laughs> so they could just Uber to practice. Um, but anyways, that's what I did for a real time. And I, and, and I got to write there. And in that time, really enough, they got to the point where um, they just, they could drive now and they didn't need me. And in that time, the woman I worked for ended up becoming the, the, the CEO of, a, or the creative executive at a big, big television company. Um, and basically was like, I know you want to write and you put in three or four years of helping, you know, raise my kids with helping rip, help do that. Like, do you want to be an intern? And so now I was like almost 30 and I was like, all right, I'll be an intern. And then I started at that level. And the cool thing about, I think getting that job at that place at that time, I can just say it's Bad Robot. I got to work at Bad Robot. Um, being there at that time, I was probably five or six years older than all the other interns. But I knew having done this for five or six years that this was an opportunity that I was not going to mess up. And therefore, I put in every minute at that place. I worked my butt off for that place because I knew this doesn't come around. I was, and I think that was a nice thing about getting it later in life a little bit was realizing that these opportunities are important and you don't want to squander them because I've squandered a lot. Um, and I did that for a little while. And then I became JJ's assistant. Um, because I worked hard and that sort of ended up leading me down the path to writing in television and film and all that stuff. And so like, if I, if I were, when you said about the path, right, the journey, like if I went up to somebody and was like, so here's the journey to how you become a television writer, you go and you f make a terrible movie, then you fail for three years, become a nanny and then become an intern and luckily get a job as an assistant. That's how you do it. But like, no one would like, that's not a path. <laughs> that's a, that's a series that's of life. lucky, you know, but, it's, but it, you know what you don't say in there that it's cool because I, we live together and I've known you for so long that I can actually put this in for you. And you can, you wrote a lot. You, you didn't, you know, I think at the time we lived together, I was writing you. I mean, you look, you really taught me how to write you and Sean, and we keep referring to this mythical man named Sean. He's a, he's a mutual friend of ours. He's an actor. Um, but you guys went to, to film school together. I, I knew nothing about that. And I just really liked the creative outlet, I want to say, and I got really into it. And you guys really taught me how to do that. But I think you step over that in those three years that you were nannying, you were writing all the time. You wrote during the day, you wrote at night, you know, it wasn't, and I don't, I don't mean to say like you, you had, you also had a life, you had a social life, you did things, but you were, it wasn't like you were just biding your time and like, oh, I'm a writer and you didn't write. You wrote all the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I think the thing that I learned from you, weirdly enough, was like, I remember you would pitch, like you would pitch an idea of me, right? 
and you're like, I have this idea. We've been watching a movie and you'd pitch an idea. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then we'd like kind of spitball a few times and talk about it over the course of like meals and stuff for the next few days. And then I remember I'd get up at one, I'd get up at like noon, like I, like I would tend to do sometimes. Um, and I'd come out and you'd been writing since like 7 a.m. And you're like, I got the first 20 pages done of that idea. And I was like, holy, what? And like, and you just would like, you would just like, you would go to the mattresses and that stuff. And you would just like, you would just write screenplay after screenplay after screenplay. And you, I think you like lapped me at one point. Like you'd written three screenplays over the course of six months before I had finished like the first act on stuff. And I was like, wow, I need that. Like, I'm like, I'm the one who's claiming to be quote unquote a writer here. And you're the one who's just like blowing me up with this stuff. And I think that was one of the things I started learning about when it went, at that point was like, you're right. I, I, I wrote the whole time that I lived with you. Um, but like one thing that I, I was really frustrated, and it's still something I'm struggling with today is like, is that follow through? It's that thing of like, I got a lot better by doing a lot of writing a lot of stuff, but like, I, I don't have a lot to show for it. And those are like, I wouldn't show a lot of the people, like I wouldn't show anybody the screenplays I wrote during that time now um, because I was still learning how to write. And, and I think that was one of the mistakes I made was I was a little too uh, worried about um, people reading that early stuff and, and it kind of taking my wind out of my sails that I basically was sort of right. I, I, you know, you, you were there. I'd come up with, I'd, I'd, be, I'd write the first 15 pages and I'd come up with another movie idea and then I'd jump to that one instead. And then I'd be, look up, it had been six months and I'd had 12, 15 page beginnings of movies, but no movie to show. And that's something that I learned a valuable lesson from, which was that like, it, everybody loves to have written, but no one likes to write. And so you you were the one who would finish something and I was the one who was so scared of that edit, that inner editor of me that I wouldn't do it and I'd look up and it had been six years and I had one pilot and a half and a dozen half unfinished you know things and and that's something that I still struggle with and then you know you got to get around that but yeah you know. Well, it's not I mean yeah it's cool I think back I hear that and I'm like man I did I, I churned stuff out but where I got stopped was I did the first draft and then I'd be like, oh, I told my story. I don't want to mess with this again. <laughs> and, you know, me and you have talked and it's like, I had some good, you had some, you know, whether, whether they were good scripts or good written well, we had, a, there were a lot of good ideas back then. Oh and yeah. You really, a, literally there's an, I, I mean, can I say after the championship is an awesome idea that should be a TV <laughs> show right now. Just going to say it. If you ever go back to it, good <laughs> idea. So, yeah, it's, I, but I think like that where what I hear and what you're saying, and this is the thing that I think everyone does, which is why I think there's value to like expand on it. There's a place where we all stop right. in every area of our life, in relationships, there's things happen and we stop. We're like unwilling to go further in our jobs, with our bosses, with a creative outlet. For me, the place I stop, it's the place I'm struggling in the second draft of my book is I wrote the first draft. I churned it out like I used to churn out material back then. And then I got feedback and I'm like, I'm uninspired. I already told this story. Yeah. But yet nobody's produces a masterpiece in one, you know what I mean? Like in one, I mean, I guess maybe artists who like paint, maybe I don't have no idea because they don't get to like redo it. Yeah. But yeah, writers, you know, like really churn through things. And I think that one of the things that, you say, you know, you didn't finish, but the thing that I'm really present to is you were always growing. There was always growth. There was always, whether you didn't finish one, maybe that was where you stopped back then, but there was always this like Ryan is becoming a better writer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, oh yeah. Um, I, it's, it's that thing where like, I think, I think there was a, there was a certain fear too. It's like funny how like, there's that thing where like, when you don't have a lot of money and like, you're just like, and you're like, okay. Like I remember one time we had to go to a birthday party and I was like, I dumped out my change drawer <laughs> to be able to go to that birthday party. Cause I'm like, I can't afford to. And I remember there's, there's that thing where like the hunger of literal hunger, I guess you would look at it. It was like when you don't have, when you're like, I got to keep working. I got to try and make this success. I got to keep pushing. And that I think pushes you to, that can work two ways. You can either push you to finish that thing that you know is great or it can, it can kind of sabotage you sometimes where that's where you keep thinking, okay, I'm writing this thing, but is this what the market wants? Is this what, the, is this what will help me get to that next step? And so you, you, you second guess and you start something else. And so that fear of writing, of spending too much time working on the wrong thing um, can sort of start to get in the way. 
Um, and I think that sometimes happens when you, when you run into that, that sec, when you finish that first draft of something too, where you start to, it, it's not that perfect thing that you thought was going to be in your brain. And then you put it on paper and it didn't come out perfectly. And so you almost question, well, is it actually saying anything interesting? Is it actually, is it, is it the thing I want to work on? And now all of a sudden you get, you get very scared of it, not scared of it, but like that thing of like, I'm going to finish this thing and it's not going to be the way that I imagined it to be. And so sometimes it's easy to sort of just abandon it or leave it for a little while and then come back when you're ready to face it. Um, and I feel like that's what I did a lot. And I feel like that's what a lot of artists and writers do sometimes is just that thing of like, I don't want to, it, it's, if you finish something, you almost have to admit to what it is. And you have to be willing to be okay I think that's the other thing. We've built these myths on some of these artists who just like, they craft something and it comes out fully formed. And that's just not true. It's never true. It just feels like it because everybody wants to, wants to, we love to, uh, we love to sort of worship the, the artist sometimes of like, oh my gosh, he's so brilliant and so great. And no one can think like him. And it's like, you didn't see the hours and hours and hours that they bang their head against the wall the same way that you are. Um, and that's the thing I, I, I've started to, kind of come around to over the years is just like realizing that that is it and that's where you find other people who help you I think that's the thing that was great with our relationship was like you would read stuff and even if you weren't you didn't go to film school and stuff but you knew what you liked and you knew what what um what spoke to you and so you would read stuff and give me notes back and I remember like oh that's great and it would help it's funny you can get a note from somebody and it either can send you two different directions it can it can answer that question that you're like oh I knew it. that's what I was trying to get at and they were able to to give it to me and then you just take it off and you start running with it and the other point is like, they can give you a note and you're like, oh, I didn't know that's the story I was telling or I didn't know that was the thing I was trying to get to. And then it's almost scary because you're like, am I not aware of the things that I'm saying or am I not aware? I don't know if that all makes sense or not, but like, that's the chaos of creation, you know? Yeah, I, so I hear that as, and I use this analogy a lot in my practice. It's like the game of Battleship. Like we all remember the game, right? The old school game and just that. And you had to say like, I'm firing into whatever letter and number B4, right? Mm -hmm. And know if your thing hit and then the person's like miss or hit or whatever. That's, to me, that's the basis of communication or storytelling, right? You want to tell a story and you're firing that missile off. And does that missile land over here with me the way you want it to be conveyed? Yeah. Now, there's only so much you can do, right? Because you could tell something that you think is suspenseful and I could think it's horrifying. Or you could tell it that, in a way that you think it's funny and I think it's horrible. There's so much perception and figuring out that way to fire your missile so it's actually interpreted the way that you want is kind of what I get from yeah. what you were just sharing. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, when you said like, like I, a lot of people might have quit, like I didn't really ever think that was really an option for me. Um, I don't, I don't want to say that sort of bullshit line of like, this is all I could do. Cause like, you know, people can do a lot of things. Like it's not, this isn't the only thing I could do. I could sell men's shoe wear very well if I had to dedicate my life to that. I'm sure I'd, I'd, that would be, that would be okay. But like, I just felt like writing wise, like it was the, it was the only, it was the thing that I woke up doing every day. Like it's the thing that I spent all my time doing. All, I mean, it, I, my fiance, like I, she's a writer as well. And literally I think that's part of our relationship is the fact that like she helps me with my stuff and I help her with her stuff. And, and that is, it's so in, it's just, it's in thy soul. That's all I do. And if I wasn't doing it as a professional, if I wasn't able to do it successfully, it's what I would just keep doing. I would have found another outlet for it. So for me, there's a point in the, it's, you know, that the part, the Rubicon, like I'd reached a point right around almost 30 where I was like, I don't really have a choice. I can't, I don't have another direction I can go in here. I've dedicated so much of my life to doing this and I've had enough. I will say this, the other thing that was like, sorry, I'm sort of backtracking a little bit, but like, I think the one thing that really helped was when I first started, I, I got a, I made a short film and it, it was the thing that I made right as I got out in, into school and it got into Cannes and I won some awards for it. And I had people tell me that it was really good. And that really sort of invigorated me to start. I had a, a success early on and I was able to sort of ride the energy of that for a really long time, knowing that like I had done this one thing correctly, which proved that I had at least hopefully act for what I was trying to do. And that pushed me, that kept my, that kept the wind in my sails for a while. 
um, even when I wasn't selling things or I wasn't getting the recognition or watching people around me who were succeeding faster than me, who were younger than me. That was what I was like, I've done this. I know I can do it. Now it's just, it's just fat cashing that again. So I, I, when I said like, I, I didn't think I could quit. I just was like, I don't know what else I would do. I don't know what else I would not be happy doing, but I just didn't think that I could, I didn't have a retreat. I didn't have a way to go backwards. And I felt like that, I think there was two types of people who succeed in this world a little bit sometimes. It's the people who are super, super talented where the world just sort of works out for them. And there were the people who may not be as super talented, but don't know it, <laughs> which I think is where I fall. And it's just like, I'm not like, I'm not Aaron Sorkin. I'm not that person. But like, I almost was like, I have this weird ego where I'm like, I can do it. I just got to keep pushing, keep pushing. Someone will figure that out. And in a weird way, that's, I think what kept, that's what eventually got me my job. It was like, I just kept kind of thinking it just was a matter of time. Um, and you know, I don't know if I was, I, I guess I got hired. So I guess I was right, but who's to say, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, there's a common theme that you just spoke to that I, I noticed through a lot of the people that have been on the podcast, which is they just kept going, which is kind of my motto, just keep going. Yeah. And what I hear in your story is to go back to that, uh, like Wizard of Oz analogy, you actually kind of put up a fence on the outside of the yellow brick road. Like there's actually no exit <laughs> because you say like, Hey, I had no choice. You got a lot of choices. You could have gone done a million other things besides selling men's shoes. Um, but you, even to take that mindset of, I don't have a choice was a choice. Was a choice. Yeah. You chose to give yourself no off ramps. And if you think about people that have done great things, I think most of them gave themselves no off ramps. Because if you take the off ramp, you can come up with all the reasons why, you know, you were being responsible, you had to make money with someone else's fault, but ultimately it's your choice to get off. You, you nannied for three years, which was something you didn't want to do. You went and became an intern at 30, which was not something you would have said, oh, this is, oh, joy. Um, I made it. <laughs> and look, I got to see you. You didn't even speak to this. Like, I got to see you live. You know, you were a dude who had to stretch money. Yeah. And, and it's not, I'm not, it's like not, I think it's actually, it's just more of a testament to your commitment. Right. It's not something to be, it's not like there's no meaning outside of it, except for I wanted this thing so bad that there were things I was willing to sacrifice to support me in getting there. Yeah, no, I, and I think that, I mean, yes, I think you make a good point in the sense that, that, um, you know, there was probably a few places where I could have just sort of gone off and found another direction. But I think that's where I got lucky, uh, in, in the sense that like, there's a quote that I've always loved and I just think it's so true, which is that no one is successful unless a lot of people want them to be. And, um, and I had lucky, I had people in my life who, who wanted me to succeed I, that gave me the opportunities and the time to be able to, to do things. You were one of them actually. Um, because living with you was one of those times where I didn't have a lot of money and I was sort of, you know, I was like, I'll take the small room in the corner because that's the, uh, you know, like the, my, that first bedroom that I, that we lived, when we first lived with Sean, like that was a tiny, tiny room. And, um, and it was just like, that's where I knew that I could, I could survive. And like, and you were willing to, you know, because you, I think we had a good thing going. It was like, you, you, you helped sort of carry me along. Um, and that's happened that happened with with the people I worked with at Nanny. They didn't have to give me a job at Bad Robot, but they believed in me. And she had she had seen and we had talked about stuff while she was there, and she knew what I wanted to do, and so she gave me that opportunity. Um, and there's there's a lot of people in my life who were people I went to college with who started off as the same thing I did when I was a nanny. They were assistants for agencies or for uh, for production companies, and those people, you know, there's this this thing where like I always thought that that networking was about finding people above you to reach down and pull you out of the masses because they recognize how great your talent was. And that's just not true. I mean, that will happen occasionally for people, but I think for the vast majority of people who are working in this industry and working in any creative industry, and I think it, it, it's that actual networking is finding people around you at the same levels that you like working with, that believe that you believe in and they believe in you. 
and that you can sort of help each other, you know, you can sort of like, I remember there was a thing of like what I was saying about reaching down. It's like, you can either wait for someone to reach down to the pit and pull you out, or you can work with the other people around you to build a ladder that you can climb out one by one. And that has been like a lot of the editors that I worked with in comic books. Those were people who were just getting, who were interns or were, you know, um, PAs at these big companies and they became editors. And then they go, Oh, I'm finally in a position to help you in the way that you help me. Um, and that has been, I think that's probably why I didn't have any off ramps is I just got, I was luckily enough to find enough people on the way that I, I would reach a spot where I probably could leave, but they were on the same path with me. So I would stay with them a little bit longer and then they would move off or they would go on a different direction. I'd find someone else and we do it that way. And I, and so to use your, your wizard of Oz analogy, like you keep finding, you know, you find the tin man and you find the cowardly lion along the line and then you help each other. You learn from each other and you push each other along. Do you know, I wish I remembered where I learned this. I think, I think it's sequoias. I thought of it while you were telling the story. I think it's the sequoia tree, but I could be wrong. So if somebody's a, a, a tree expert, I don't know what tree <laughs> experts are called, but if you're somehow there's a tree expert and like, you're wrong, maybe I'm just wrong about the name of the tree. But I think it's sequoias. That they, they're some of the tallest trees and some of the strongest, but they're like pretty thin, I think, in relationship to like uh, redwoods or whatever. But their roots, all kind of like link under the under the ground they don't go super deep mm -hmm. but they're under the ground and all their roots like link together and it's why they're so firm and strong that they can withstand like storms and all these things because they essentially all hold each other up yeah um that's what i got from that this the strength in the strength in numbers yeah it's funny i was actually watching it yesterday the new it and when the kids like throw have the rock fight yeah. with like the bully kids and i was like yeah they would win there's like eight of like eight people can throw rocks a lot faster than three <laughs> and you just have that thing like there's strength in numbers right and like one of them would get taken out but there was enough that they could stay fighting together and that's yeah. kind of the moral of that whole movie right is that together they're strong and individual like as individuals they're weaker yeah and, and, and i know it sounds cliche to say that but it's just like it's just that's the thing is like you rise together as like you rise together as a ring. And I think it's why it takes so many people the same amount of time to sort of break in. Like people always ask about breaking into this industry and like why, how people want to do it. How do you get into TV? How do you get into comic books? How do you get into movies? And it's like, I think that's why everybody has such a hard time telling people, oh, this is what you have to do. Because everybody, they don't know who you're going to meet on your path along the way. So there's no way to be like, go find the next great filmmaker and write their movie for them. Like that's, like how, there's no way to dictate that. So I think that's why you always hear people say, just keep writing, just keep pushing forward and help other people on the way because it's, there's no direct path. There's no way to, to sort of say, this is the, this is the answer. Um, and which is, you know, can be frustrating for certain people, but I think it's also, it just shows, that, that's the nice thing too about it as well is because there's not one set path that we all have to get on, that actually leaves a lot more, there's a lot of other paths that are just, not having people haven't found yet, you know, like the nanny to intern route. That's the one I found. I got lucky and I stumbled <laughs> off the gold, the, the, the golden brick road and found that way. So, you know, I think that's, that's the thing that I take out of a lot of sort of like, when you go on your journey, you just go find other people. Cause you're the more people you have around you, the more people that are all sort of going in the same direction. Y there's no way that that's going to be a bad thing. I, it get, it can get competitive, but only competitive in the sense that like, you know, you, you want to be, everybody wants, you want to be the, you want to be, uh, you know, John Lennon, you want to be that one friend, but like, yeah, the Beatles as a group still did pretty well. I don't, know if that makes sense, but that's, that's the way I look at it is like, you got to find the, y your time will come. Just keep pushing people forward. Yeah. Well, and to know that if you're willing to do that, you guys clearly, you know, all the different people around you, you're not worried about somebody else like taking from you, that yeah. there's actually, there's actually enough to go around. Like, because you sell a comic book idea doesn't actually mean that Bob, you know, this made up Bob guy that I'm talking about right now can't sell one either. Yes. Or, that, or that all your other friends can't sell one. That there's yeah, actually people, room people get really worried about credit early on and don't worry about that. You really, it's not, don't like people get freaked out about that. Oh, that person's gonna steal my idea or I gotta do that. At the early stages, you, your ideas are, you're, you're gonna come up with a thousand more before you get done with that one. And, and so this just like, People are, will remember how hard you worked far more than what you 
the thing you worked on. They remember working with you and helping you that way. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. What do you, um, what's been, that's, what's been the biggest challenge to overcome as you've started to actually, like once you broke out of the intern role and like assistant role and actually got into the writing role where you are paid writer, you don't have any other jobs. So now you've, let's just say that for the general person who's not a writer, you've now crossed over into the, the realm of the thing you want to do, but haven't like reached the real goal yet. You know, there's a bigger goal than just Scott sliding by and getting paid to write. What's been the biggest challenge in getting from that level to the next level? Um, it's probably two parts. I think the first part is you sort of, uh, it's that, 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 you know, like you think, okay, I'm a, I'm a, I want to be a working writer. And then the next step is working writer. And you think that when you pull back the curtain on that and you step into the next world, that it's going to be so much like, oh, it's easy and, and perfect. And, and now I'm just, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm cruising. Right. And that's not at all the way it is. Like you, in a weird way, all you, you, you step into the next level and there are so many, there were so many other hurdles that you had no idea were there. Like, you're like, Oh wow. I actually have to like you. Okay. One of the nice things about being somebody on the, on the, who doesn't get to work in the industry and the business is that you make assumptions on how you think things are done. You're like, well, like you see a move. We've all seen a movie and we're like, I could have done that better or I could have written that or whatever, but you don't know the politics on the other side of that curtain that that writer had to navigate in order to do that. And I think that's been one of the biggest eye-opening moments is like you go and you're like, well, obviously they should have done this story or obviously they should have written it this way. And then you get in and now you have to, you go, well, I want to do it this way. And they go, well, here's the 50 reasons as to why you can't do that. And you're like, wow, I, I just assumed that you just don't know the, all of the politics that happen in play. And I, so, so when you step on the other side of that, you start to become aware of that and you start to understand, and all of a sudden you start to sort of reverse engineer. You're like, oh, that's why they did this. I get that now. So that's the first thing I think was sort of, you, you get into that world and you all sort of, you make assumptions as to what you think things are. Um, I think the other thing is, is just sort of getting out of your own way as the thing that I still struggle with. It's like, I, I thought that I would know how to, I thought I would be, I thought there would be a different version of me. There would be a, a future version of me that was smart and confident and, and much better looking and, uh, and just, and just uh, sort of a ready for the slings and arrows that you would get. And you have to realize that, that's, that you are what you are and that, every, that you, there's not going to be some magic version that knows how to deal with everything. Um, and so you almost sort of have to, I think that earlier that you accept that and you just, realize that you're not always going to have the answers and that you are going to have to struggle and you are going to make the wrong turn and you are going to make mistakes and that it won't be smooth sailing. Um, and that there's a thousand, there's a thousand things you haven't even imagined. I think the sooner you realize that the easier you can able, you can stop trying to avoid them and take them on, take them on head on. And I think that's the two things that I've learned about working as a professional. You said something before about the the creativity piece, like that you go in and it might not go how you want, which is great because that's how life is, right? We want things to go a certain way and they don't. We want our partners to do certain things and they don't want to. Um, where do you, from a creative standpoint, I kind of in my head was like, oh, there's three ways that that can go, right? You could fight for your creativity, for the thing that you want. You could let it go and just go with what they want you could find something that works for both of you, or there's probably 30 other options that I'm just not thinking. <laughs> but how do you deal with that so far? You know, it's, it's not like you've done this for 30 years at this point and, you've, and you have the power to say, no, how I say goes, you know, you're, you're not there yet. But so far, how do, you, how do you deal with that? When you walk in, if you're super attached to something and who's ever above you essentially says, we can't do that or you can't do that. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, that happens every day. Um, uh, it's, it's, hmm, that's a good point. I, there was something, okay. So when I first made that, that really, that, that, that movie I made, I remember we were on like day 18 or 18 or 19 of 20. So we shot 28 locations in 26 days. It was something insane like that. And I remember like, after like three weeks, it was like, 
8 a.m. on like a Sunday and everybody was exhausted because we worked all night long. And I remember my, uh, we, I was being kind of a tyrant on set. I was like yelling about things because things weren't quite right. And I was dealing with stuff and I was just being mean. And um, as being what I thought a director would do, right? And I remember my friend Ben came up to me and he was like, hey man, just FYI, just like remember this. He's like, everybody on this set is, is making less than you which wasn't true, but his point was like, they were making <laughs> no money because they were all doing an independent film. Right. Mm. And they, he's like, they're all here because they love making movies. They're all here because they want to be a part of something. Like they all want to be a part of the next great indie movie. And that's why they're donating their time. So you don't have to be a jerk to them. Like realize that they're doing this because they love it and they all have their own reasons. And I've thought about that as, I remember that in every step that I take. Like when I work in a comic book industry and you go up against people who may be the executives or the editors or the other creatives around you, and you can, they're saying something that you vehemently believe is not true and you should not go down this path. I always try to take a step back and go, they're doing this too because they love this. Like they are in this industry because they might not be exactly where they want to be either, but they're, they're, they're not, no one's torpedoing you. They're just trying to do the thing that they love the, to the best of their abilities. And I think when I, when I've approached every process with that eye, with that idea that everybody's no, no one's trying to hurt you, that everybody's trying to work together to make the best thing. You just have to get to round of their point of view as to why they're saying it. So even if they're wrong, the minute you identify why they're saying it and what they're saying, you guys can come to the, you can come to, and sometimes when you do that, they'll actually fold into the idea of what you're doing. You won't have to compromise at all. You'll be, they'll, they just weren't, like you said, it was the battleship communication. They weren't hearing what you were, you were trying to do this and they were hearing the opposite or something different. And the minute you guys can get on the same page there, um, you can, you can get both get what you want. I feel like if you go in with the attitude of everybody else is wrong and I'm right and I have to prove it to people, that's when people, other people you work with will actually start to just fight for their ideas, regardless of they're right or wrong, because they don't feel like they're being heard. Yeah. So it's like relationship is actually everything. Um, oh, oh my gosh. Relation. Absolutely. Every, I have this wonderful editor on, on Power Rangers who. Um, I love working with, and I do not agree with many of the things that they say, mm -hmm. um, but I respect them so much and enjoy the collaborative process with them so much that it has, it has made it, it's, it's become a friendship now. It's just fun. We talk and we, we, just, we get to the point where we can, the, I think the better friends you are with sometimes, you can really disagree with each other, but then like, at least you, but you respect them. And if you, you ha if you respect them, you can, you'll listen. You know what I mean? Like, I, and like, I feel like if you, the worst thing you can do is have contempt for somebody you're working with, because then even when they have the right answer, you're not going to listen. So I do, when you said like relationships are so key, like get the, get to know them, get to understand what they want, why they want certain things. It'll just make your job so much easier. I think at any, in any profession, creative or otherwise, when you can find out who the people around you have to work with, what they want and why they want it, then you will stop fighting over the stuff in the middle. Like you fight over, so many people just want to be right. You know, they just want to make sure that they're right. And like, they don't even care about what they're right about. And I feel like that's the death of any creative process. I also, yeah. And it sounds like from this whole conversation, there was so much learning that happened, whether, I don't know that you knew it at the time. And I think this, we could apply this to everyone, right? I don't care if you're a yoga teacher or a writer in an art, you know, an architect or a lawyer, there's so much stuff that happens in the beginning of our journeys, whether it be in the beginning of our life or that specific field. There's these moments that happen that I don't know that we know like how powerful they're going to be later on. Like that thing you learned on your first, basically your first movie, yeah. which you don't even want to say the title of it because of the experience, but you learned a lesson that is completely changing who you're behaving, who you're being in your work now. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there was this, um, this, this, um, uh, guy who ran for mayor. Um, and he said, and he lost by like 200, 300 votes and they were, and there was, it was rough. It was a really hard campaign. And they were at, and they were like, are you sad about what happened? He's like, because I'm disappointed for the people who supported me. But like, he's like, I'm guaranteeing you that no, he's like anything that I've ever fought for and wanted never turned out exactly the way that I wanted, but it always turned out better in the long run. 
in either because if you lost, you learn from it and you're able to do it better the next time or you won and, and then you, and then you figured it out. So like this, you, you got what you wanted. So I, I, I think that's true to any journey, like you said, where it's like, it might not like, this is not at all the way I imagined my filmmaking career. I, I would have won by, I should have three Oscars by now. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, four. Uh, but my point is, is like you, you have this vision of what you think it's going to be and what you want to say and why you want to do it. Um, and it's not going to be that. It's not at all going to be that path. But if you just, if it all just fell right into your lap, I don't think you would ultimately end up telling the stories and the things that matter to you the, the same way. You know, you have to, it's that thing. It's like every bad relationship you has, hopefully if you do it right, is the thing that will make it so that your next relationship is better. And ultimately when you find the right person, um, you'll have had all those horrible relationships will basically teach you, you know, like this is the way I should be with this person. I don't know. Now we're talking about marriage counseling. I just, I just have to pick that you just said all the horrible relationships. Not that they couldn't have been okay or maybe not great, but they had to be horrible. They had to be. <laughs> I purposely sabotaged every single one of them to make them as bad as possible so I to could get, learn yeah. from them. Yeah, so you could succeed. I just, I, it's funny, as we were talking, I actually drew um, blocks, like building blocks, and then like three, two, and one. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I didn't know how to write what I wanted to say when you were speaking. And I just, that was the image that came to my mind was that you spent a lot of time building the foundation. And now maybe you're at like the middle row and you got to build that up because the, the next level, it actually requires you to, you can't just go from the bottom to the top. Yeah. You kind of did in that, like, I get to make my first feature. Yeah. You know, in the, and really that was actually the bottom. It looked like it could have been, but it's a very cool process as just as I'm listening to you and writing this down, I'm like, Oh, it's just a reminder that the journey is like putting the blocks together and to get to a higher point. Like you can't, you can't flow levitate up to the higher level. You actually have to build the blocks together. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, like certain people I think have been like, are there certain very, very amazingly talented people who can, who can go from, you know, you can, you can, be in film school one moment and then a year later you've sold a project and now you're the biggest Hollywood director. Those happen. Those, those things are out there. Um, but I just think for, for me, um, it was, it's a lot, it's like you said, it's building a foundation. It was a lot of, it was a lot of missteps and a lot of learning situations that helped me eventually sort of find the thing that I wanted to do and find the, the thing. I just wasn't ready for it. Um, and I don't know if I ever will be a hundred percent ready. Like, I don't think you're ever ready for the, if, I guess if you're, I think you're, if you're doing it right, you should never be a hundred percent ready for the next step in your, in your journey. Mm -hmm. And it, I also wonder like in, even in that example of like the person who does get out of film school or the baseball player who gets right out of college and is a phenom and unheard of. I actually think the thing that the challenge in their life might just not be that thing that we see. Right. Like, you know, that guy who gets out of film school and gets to direct some big movie or, or just hits it out of the park the first time, we don't know that that's the challenge, that he's actually, that, we just don't know what else is in someone else's space. Like yeah, what that's our end zone, but not necessarily their end zone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like it looks like it, right? Because it's what you want or it's what I want. Yeah. Like the guy who launches a podcast and is just five episodes in has like a million downloads because of other things, but their goal or their vision, or maybe it's not even about that. Maybe for them, there's some belief that they're not good enough, like something internal, that no matter how much they succeed, they're still not good enough. Yeah, Kobe Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, who, right? It's like a totally different game. I think, yeah. you know, I, this, that's actually, I love that you brought up basketball. Like the, that game, like LeBron just is going to another championship, right? Yeah. And I'm looking at this guy who, he's done more with less most of his career. And yet it's, it's still like not, it almost like occurs, like it's still not enough. Right. Like what else can this human being do? And, well, and we I, don't know, right? Yeah. Jalen, I don't, I think it was, I saw Jalen Rose said something. I think it was Jalen Rose who was like, I think he actually prefers the version where he has to take, like, I don't know if he would enjoy the same, if he was on the Golden State Warriors. Like, I think having all those guys around him, I don't think that's what drives him. I think in a weird way, when Kevin Love goes down and you, it's you and four guys and, and you have to put the weight, because look at the way he responds in pressure situations. Yeah. It's amazing. And 
I think he, that's part of what – that's one of his end zones a little bit is like that thing where he like – he. I know it's hard, but I think that's where he, he finds that, that drive, that thing inside of him that makes him go, you know, I'm going to do this. And he rises to the occasion every time, and it's amazing. It's, it's uh, one of my old – um, like mentors in the restaurant industry used to always say this, like your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. So like your, his greatest strength to essentially have to do it alone in a way or with guys that aren't the other like great is his greatest strength. Cause he can, he can actually, he can actually rise to this crazy level. And then there's times that the, the, the opposing force is too great. And no matter how high he rises, it's just not enough because he's playing against five guys just like him. And I think that that's a great, the thing that made you, likely the thing that makes us, whatever, whatever we're great at is also the thing holding us back. Well, yeah. But we I mean, actually have to identify it. You kind of did for me. I didn't realize until you just said it, but like one of the things that I'm always so nervous about when I'm working on anything is I'm always jumping to the next project or the next idea because I, because I get nervous about whether or not I'm gonna focus too much time on the wrong ideas. And so one of my skills is the ability to generate a lot of ideas, like another movie, another movie, another movie, another TV show, a combo, because you just keep going and going and going. But that's my problem too, is it, it breaks my focus. So it's the thing that I have, might have 50 ideas, but like I've finished maybe one, maybe two, maybe if I'm being nice, three or four, you know, and that's the same thing. It's that, it's that. It, 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 I, my nerves create this drive to create more things. And I know other people who have a really, who have one idea and they just focus on that for years and years and years. And I'm like, that's amazing. I don't know how you do that, but then they'll finish it. And then I'll be like super jealous. <laughs> yeah. What is, um, if you had to give one piece of advice to anybody working on any dream that's big that, you know, like yours or mine, from the starting point almost feels like it probably couldn't happen or it's not possible. What would be the piece of advice you'd give them? Um, I would say the biggest advice I can give, cause it's one of the biggest regrets I've had is not um, celebrating the little victories. Um, no matter how small um, celebrate those little victories every step of the way. Um, the, and that's not just cause I think some people see celebrating a, a small victory as letting up, taking their foot off the gas a little bit. And that, that when you do that, it could, it could stop you from getting where you want, where you want to be. And I feel like in any creative industry, you're going to have so many highs and so many lows. And there's going to be moments where you think I'm, I am milliseconds from achieving my dreams. This is it. This is the thing I've been building my entire life for. And then the next day it falls apart and it's gone. And you, you, if you don't, celebrate the little victories if you don't even if it's if it's finding it's getting an agent to read your stuff if it's if it's having a good meeting if it's having somebody call you back you know it's as simple as that those little things can be so it's if it's when you are successful like you've gotten that first paid job and go have dinner go have go a celebrate that moment and enjoy that feeling embrace that feeling because if you don't do that you're gonna and if you only are worried about the about the next failure you you will create a situation i think where you 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 start it's like those people who who are sports sports fans who are like they don't it's, they don't love the wins as much as they hate the losses and i feel like that can be a danger in working in any creative industry where you you're you get that thing but then you thought you should you that's what you should have got you got that thing so you didn't celebrate it the way that like that was a that was a nice little mark you get more, you're more worried about, well, I got to get the next step and I got to get the next step. And then like, you start looking up and it's like, why are you doing this? Are you only doing this so that you don't, so that you, to prove other people wrong? I don't know. That's the thing I would say I, I need to do more of. I love that. It's actually, I did a, one of my podcasts was on like the, the obstacle or your brain is like the, I forget what I titled it. I should know, right? It's my podcast, <laughs> but like your brain is the biggest obstacle that we have. And it actually goes back to the human conditioning of how our mind evolved over time that negativity sticks to us like Velcro and okay. positivity slides off, off us like Teflon because a thousand years ago as early human beings, you know, carrots were, avoiding sticks was much more beneficial than getting carrots. You know, you could live without, you could live longer without food, but if you made one wrong step and you got eaten by a tiger, that was your one mistake and you were done. 
So yeah. we actually trained ourselves to be like that. But in most of us, people listening to this podcast, we don't live in a world where we're under constant siege to like where we might not be alive. And it's cool that you, I had a moment last week, about two weeks ago, a guy called me and wanted to talk to me about what I was up to. And he said, I just want to be a part of Dream Mason. Like, I don't even know what it is, but I want to be a part of it. Now, if you had asked me out of context, I would have been like, all I want is somebody to pose in that, that Dream Mason pose that I do, or say they want to be a part of what I'm up to or whatever. And I got off the phone with this guy and I, it like went right by me. And it took me a few days and I went, oh my God, that was the thing that I, he's just the first, he's just the first one. Yeah. And then last week, not even last week, uh, whatever, a few days ago, and that might not be when we, when this comes out, but uh, a friend of mine with her dad and her brother are hiking and they dropped into that pose that I always do and sent me a photo and I was like, oh my God, but this, but I learned and I did exactly what you said. I kind of, I practiced like holding on to it just yeah. for a moment, like being with the joy that I felt versus like, okay, well, it's only one. I should have had 50 people already, you know? Yeah. So yeah, really I, I, I feel like that's that's the thing. You have to sort of, it, it's like that's the moment. Like that, if you do, you got you you get so caught up in the in the in the workings of of trying to get the dream that you forget how excited you would have been at any one of the little tiny successes that have, that come along with that journey. Um, yeah, it, it, it's 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 so funny because it's so it's fun and it's scary and um, and like it's amazing how so many of us, like we all have so many friends who are trying to do this stuff. They all have dreams. They all have, they have aspirations and stuff. And like, I think we've all looked at some of our friends and I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about other friends, but like other friends where you're just like, I don't know if they're ever going to get where they're going, why they want to go. I don't know if that's, if, if that's, if they're going to make it. But like, I remember sometimes seeing that and go, they really love, you know, they really love what they're doing and why they're doing it. And like, and, and that's a nice reminder sometimes. Nice. Oh, well, I got some, I have some quick rapid fires for you. Sure. And I, I come up with these sometimes while I'm doing it. It's not planned. So I just thought of them. They're all in relationship to your world and what you do. So if there's a book that helped you, that you think helped you the most in your life, what would it be? The okay. authors that you don't pick won't be left, let out. Left. <laughs> uh, if there was a book, uh, I should read more is what you're basically telling me. Um, <laughs> there's one book. Uh, this sounds silly, but it was a science fiction book that I read when I was a little kid called Ender's Game uh, by Orson Scott Card. Um, I, it's, it's a sci-fi book about a world where uh, aliens have basically, alien invasion almost happened and now we're training little kids to be soldiers. And the thing that I really loved about it was it was uh, it, you're seeing it all from a kid's point of view and you're watching him tactically learn how to deal with people. Um, and I remember that was the, that hearing, being inside someone else's head as they were literally trying to figure out how to deal with success and failure and friends and enemies, um, and seeing that they could think things that were three, two or three steps ahead of the game and, and understand motivations and wants and needs at an early age was something that I really hit me because it, it made me look at every interaction I've had with people and reframe it and reshape it, um, not in a manipulative way, but just as an understanding of base wants and needs. So that book was sort of huge and very much, like it was a big part of, of you know, who I am and how I, how I interact with people. Nice. Uh, if you could have written any movie that's already been made, what would the movie have been? Memento, 100%. I would have, I would have, I would have written Memento. Uh, that's, that's really cool because you've been saying that since for the last 15 years, whatever. Yeah, it it hasn't time. changed. I know when I saw that movie um, and I saw it three times in the theater and it was the movie that, that did everything that I think a good movie, an amazing movie can do. It, it reshaped, the, it used the medium in a way that I hadn't seen before. It, it made me ask questions. Uh, it made me empathize with a character that I, I wouldn't normally empathize with, but um, saw and uh, saw myself in and asked questions that scared me. And there's an existential question in the middle of it that I remember getting like sweaty palms thinking about the concept that he just poses one line of dialogue. Um, that movie is amazing. And the best thing about that movie was I actually got to meet the Jonah Nolan um, who wrote it. And he ended up being every bit as cool and every bit as gracious and nice to me. They always say, don't meet your heroes. I did and it was, he surpassed what I wanted him to be. Um, and so that's probably why that movie has, it, it sort of, inf it's, inf in, it's in influenced my appreciation of that movie was meeting the person behind it and having that person um, 
see me as a professional and want me to succeed. And that makes that, that just sort of locks that movie in as that's what I would wish. So funny. I've never, all the people that I would say are my heroes that I've met and I've met, I want to say a few of them. They've always been fantastic. Like I've never had that. Yeah. I mean, when I met Larry David, I met Larry David. Yeah. You did? When did that happen? I met Larry David uh, probably 10 years ago at a restaurant. And he made a and he made a joke about like a self deprecating joke that was hilarious. <laughs> That's awesome. And I met like in this space, I met Lewis Howes at an airport, and I was like having like one of the worst days. I don't know that you know who Lewis Howes is, but like a motivational speaker, podcaster, author, mm-hmm. um, and I was having one of the worst, one of the worst. I want I want to say one of the hardest days of my life. And I met him on that morning at the airport where I could barely like I had sunglasses on because I couldn't hold back tears. And he was, and the first thing he said to me was like, give me a hug. Oh, and it was wow. like, um, you know, I met a few others, but they've always been the people that I thought they would be like Larry David saying something negative about himself. That's how you should meet. Larry David. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, if you could have written any comic book character, who would it be? Batman. I mean, come on. Yeah. Like it, Batman is the most, Everybody loves Batman. If you don't love Batman, I don't, I don't understand you. But uh, I, would, I would say I would love, I, I, that was the first book I ever wrote was the first line of dialogue was writing Batman. And that was weird. Cause like, I, I think that's the thing about comic books that I love more than any industry. And I, I said this before, but I just think it's, it's, it's the thing. It's the only medium where people have been working with the same character for 75 years. What, William Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. No one else has written Hamlet. I know there's a Hamlet too, that doesn't count. Um, but no one's writing those characters. That character story is, is defined. And comic book characters are a wall that is constantly being changed and adjusted. And in each writer's goal is that they want to put a brick in that wall and influence the character that influenced them. And so that's the brilliance of comic books, in my opinion, is why I hope that medium stays strong at some point. Um, because I would love the idea of going in and being like, you know what? I've always had this question on Superman. I'm going to add this question to the thing. And that becomes a part of, of who they are. That's amazing. Yeah. That is the coolest thing ever. Um, and I really want to do that at some point. So Batman and Superman would be like to be able to influence, to, to have a little kid read one of my books and go, oh my gosh, like this is my Superman. I'd be like, Psh, I'm done. I'm retiring. I'm out. Two more. So if you could work with one actor or actor or actress, um, that either in a direct, like as a director or having written the, you know, their parts in the script that they chose to be in, who would that person be? They can be living or dead. I don't care. <laughs> um, I don't, it's not one person. I mean, there's like a type of person that I'm really interested in working with. Like, like I'm really interested in like the Tom Cruise, uh, Will Smith, uh, The Rock, like those people that they just seem to always keep working and they just seem to understand what their audience and what their fans want. And they seem to do it in a very, they can be both, they're both like socially responsible and, and creatively fulfilling. I think that's such a rare, you can't, it's hard to find those people. And like, like for instance, like Tom Cruise, like Tom Cruise, regardless of how you feel about him and and for other reasons, like there's just something about the fact that the guy just knows how to make a movie and he just seems to like, he always, like, I love the idea that he's built movies around wanting to do things in his personal life. Like, he's like, I want to learn how to fly a helicopter, so we're going to do that. Like, I just love that he's, he has found this way to, to merge those two things. Um, and that's amazing to me. So, like, to be around them and see the way that they have taken the world a little bit by the, by the horns and sort of aimed it in ways that they want, like, I just find that fascinating. So, that's what I would, I think those three guys have done that. And, like, it's just cool to be, I just love, I want to see how they do that. Like, how do they bend the world to their, to their whims? Or, or are they? I don't know. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's, they, there are people that occur like they always win. Yeah. And I don't, and I can't, we can't, I'm not speaking about their personal life or their emotions, but the thing they do for their profession, it's like always a win. There's no flops. Yeah. And that, I think that's a testament to the, to the, um, to the way they hook us. There's something about, cause look, we could find things about all their personal lives that we might not manage or not agree with, but there's something about their work that hooks us. Yeah. That has us support what they do. I mean, Tom, Tom Cruise, I used to have this debate with this guy that I knew in New York and, and he was right. I never, I couldn't argue it. 
was that he's he is the if there was a, a Jerry West logo for actors, like have an NBA logo, it would be Tom Cruise because he is a movie star. Like there is no movie star like Tom Cruise. Everything is gold that he t- basically touches. Yeah. And that is, that's a pretty amazing thing. The, well, the even, seems to be and, even when they aren't gold, like you understand why he did them. Like, you know, like he was trying, like I really respect certain actors who are like, I know what I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this thing. And it might not be what you want me to make, but I'm gonna try and make this thing. And even if it fails, I'll have learned something or I'll have grown from it or I'll have tried that thing that I was always afraid of. It seems like with his, with his movies in particular, he does two, one of two things. He's either, he's either like, I wanna try something physically that I've never seen and always wanted to try. Or, and there's been roles like, for instance, uh, Rock, I think it was Rock of Ages. Like, he's like, I'm gonna take on this role that you wouldn't see me in, like Magnolia. He takes yeah. on those roles yeah. where he's like, I'm gonna try this and you might hate me for it but I'm going to do it and I'm going to grow from it, even if it fails. And like, there's a respect level that I have for that, that I really, that I want to, I want to know is like, is that, does he know that every time? Or is that something he finds as he's doing it? You know what I mean? Like, it's just that mental approach to, to certain things. I want to, are you as confident and as driven and as sort of aware of everything as it seems like you are? Cause damn, I want to learn how to do that. Thanks. Um, if people want to follow you, read your comics, you know, see what movies you're writing or, or just reach out to you, like what's, how do they do that? What do you want them to do? Um, I am on Twitter. Uh, I'm on, uh, I'm at, every time I say this, it sounds like the most pretentious title at that Ryan parrot. Which I, <laughs> so that right. might change. It's uh, yeah, it's, and it's two R's and two T's. Um, and I'm on Instagram, but I don't remember my name. Uh, I, I should, be. I don't, I don't post that much. Um, but I do, I, Twitter's fun cause I, I, there's been a lot of interactions with the fans of the comics books I've been writing and I've been, I try to, I try to be accessible to them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the way you find me. I'm not on Facebook. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, is there anything people can look for? Like if they want to read one of your books or what, what? Oh yeah. Um, so right now I'm currently writing uh, Go Go Power Rangers for Boom Studios. Um, and uh, we're in the middle of a big event called Shattered Grid, uh, which is a big crossover between us and the Mighty Morphin Power Ranger book, which has been really fun. But um, if you pick up my book, you really don't need to know that much about Power Rangers to, to, to get into it. I write it. It's, to me, this is the book that I always wanted to write. It's basically more, it's like 25% fighting giant monsters and weird putties and stuff. And 75% of like, what's it like to grow up in high school and have too many responsibilities and like people that don't like you and 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 trust your friends and all that stuff so it's all like the high school stuff that i grew up on a lot of it's from my personal experience so that's what i'm writing right now and then i have um i have a book coming out with aftershock in august uh with lee the one of your friends and probably the reason i'm doing the book god bless you uh, <laughs> But I'm um, doing a book called Volition, which is uh, a science fiction fable um, that comes out in August. Nice. Uh, all right. I'm going to give you, you get, if you want it, you don't have to take it. But you're, you're one of the only people, we talked about this, you're one of the only people that has known me for as long as you've known me, watched me just shift and change. What do you get? 30 seconds, a minute? You can, I'm like, we were joking. It's like this idea of you could share whatever you want about me that to let people see me from a new perspective. Oh, um, and we don't even have to. You don't this have to This is like you giving me a loaded gun here. This is awesome. And you're like, I'm gonna put this apple on my head and I'm gonna go stand over here and you can take, put this blindfold and this gun on and see what happens. You just wasted 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, <laughs> what do I, uh, Alex has the best hair of anybody that I know. Uh, and it shifted. I've seen a lot of different versions of the hair. <laughs> It's gone from no hair to, to, to sort of like, it's gone back. This is sort of more of the original alpha, alpha Alex. Um, what do I want to know? Um, he invented the churro shake at, at uh, the counter. That's what people should know. You invented the, the churro shake. So that you should, people should know that. Um, but no, I, I, can I, can I, have, can I have 10 more seconds? Cause I wasted it. Go for it. Okay. Um, I've seen you go through a lot of, personal stuff and I've seen you go through a lot of professional stuff um I've never seen you more happy than you are now um and I've never seen you more driven to influence and impact other people's lives uh and I think we're all better for it thanks 
Thanks for doing this. Um, this is a long podcast, which is great because I think there's a lot of value. I didn't intend to take up this much of your time. Um, well, but thanks for being my friend. friend. <laughs> thanks for well, thanks for being honest. Thanks for letting me, you know. Thanks for bringing in the vulnerable stuff. Thanks for actually like really presenting the journey, all of it, not just the good stuff, but the the nannying, the like the real things. You know, I think some sometimes we just see that top peak of the iceberg with people, and they only present like they gloss over what it took. So thanks for being willing to be real and honest and vulnerable and really touch on the things that actually got you where you are. Um, yeah, I'm like, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start over. I just said, did you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a dog. Um, yeah, but thanks for being real. Thanks for coming on here. Thanks for doing this for me as a friend. Um, I just, I appreciate you. So thanks. Yeah, my pleasure, man. It was fun. We should, this is, this is how we always talk. It's just nice to actually put it on the record. <laughs> yeah. And we'll do, we'll have to do one of these. I always, there's people that I've had on here that are like working on some big things that when that first movie goes, the, the movie you're writing that we, you know, we'll yeah. have to do one of these like live in person, you know, absolutely after the premiere or something cool like that. Totally agree. Absolutely. All right, man. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Dream Mason Podcast. Please subscribe to the Dream Mason Podcast so you don't miss an episode. Share it with a friend and give us a review on iTunes. I am grateful to have had you here. If you want more, you can follow or reach out to me, Alex Terranova, on Instagram at inspirationalalex or at thedreammason.com or email me at alex at thedreammason.com. And remember, you are a dream mason because your dreams don't build themselves.